All other views and opinions expressed here are those of the individual speaking and may not be representative of Coding American. At times, language may be considered vulgar. Listener discretion is suggested. You are now listening to the Coding Behind the Wheel podcast. So when I think about that whole experience, I think about the times that people don't understand. Like, so, so let's take them back. Let's go into preseason, right? We're, we're there right now. We're, we're months out from the start of the season. Mm-hmm. And so, so what kind of days are you working to get this car? I mean, first, you got to work a regular job. But then what kind of things are you doing to get ready? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, during then I was working just my normal nine to five at the shop inside you know, in the office and helping guys process orders get things shipped out right and it was like 5 30 hits the day's over for us and it's literally walk out back and go to work you know, during the you know we had uh you know bub who ended up just recently going uh moving away right uh, so he was there kind of full-time uh, as far as like our chassis builder and our our like program manager for the like, the chassis builds and all right. that so you know he'd be out there for you know his eight hours i come up and be like all right where are we at what do I need to do? You know, what, what do we got to get done? And it was, you know, he's like, all right, well, I'm here on this point. We can grab this and clean this and get this ready to go back in. You know, this needs to get ordered. This has got to get ordered. You know, check on the engine. How's that coming along? Where's this part? I need you go run on this thing first in the morning. So it was like, there's just constant stuff that you got to, you know, have planned out. And sometimes, you know, all right, cool. I got all that stuff ordered like three weeks ago. Where is it? And you do call a manufacturer and it's like, oh, well, we were on back order of it. We're not going to have it for right. another two and a half weeks. Right. So then you spend, you know, an hour and a half, two hours of the day calling other shops that potentially sell this product to see if they have it on their shelf just so you can get it overnighted to have it now because, you know, it ended up showing up late. <laughs> and we're so plagued. I swear every time it happens in, in our preseason is like, there's always something that we have to get. We have to overnight it. Right. And no matter. <laughs> No matter what happens, we overnight it, and UPS or FedEx or whoever will lose it. So now it's just become a point where when we get to that point and we have that one item that we know we have, like we have to have tomorrow, we just order two from two, like one from each different place, right? Because the chances of losing both of you know an overnight <laughs> shipment is completely different, you know, than than with one. So now we've just you know it's just you know silly precautions like that you have to right. take. But you know, there's been times to where it's like, all right, cool, like you know we can go to the dyno, we can do this, but you know, this part for the nitrous system didn't, didn't come in, so we can get the car mostly tuned. You can kind of go do a shakedown with the car and then come back on Monday when that part actually shows up, and then we can do the final tune with it. It's right. Like, All right, well, let's, let's go and do it. It's only time we have the test, so we're just going to get it done. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's like we've, we've done our fair share of shipping the tracks, you know, shipping yep. right to the track for you guys. But so, like, so even during the off season, you know, you're, you're working a full day, then you're going back out, and you, you got another few hours – you know, there, and then you're going home. So you're already pulling a, a pretty long day. And then, but now, now you're in season. So, so yep. in an in season day, <clears throat> you're now, you have, you have travel, you have yep. the competition, then you're, then you're traveling back. And most of the time you drive your own car and trailer. Yep. Yeah. I'm driving the dually in the, in the trailer as well as one of the guys from the shop is riding with me. Right. Uh, you know, so in season stuff, um, you know, beginning of last year after Long Beach, uh, I was able to cut down my days in the office and spend more days out back with the car to keep things going because after Long Beach, we only had two weeks to get the S14 yeah. ready for Orlando and being that I had to run out the door, I didn't even have a chance to pull the engine from the car after it locked up before we left. Right. So, um, you know, Bub flies back from the events uh, last year, so he flew back and got started on pulling the engine uh, out of that car the spare had just been, I think, finished getting built. So that one was going in and we go back and it's just, then it's just long nights of getting everything back, you know, swap from the one engine over to the other, getting it in the car, getting it all plumbed up and ready to go. And then it's like, all right, cool. Now we can go back to the dyno and actually get the cartoon. And I think, I don't even know if I ever got a test day with the 14 before we went into FB that, at Orlando. Right. I don't think we did. We ended up, I think my test day and shaking out of that car was Thursday practice of FB. So, right. <laughs> yeah, it's all super last minute. And thankfully, like that event was close. Like if that was a Seattle event, uh, you know, I I don't think I would have been able to make it. You know, right. to come back, I would just leave from Long Beach and drive straight up with the R32 and just run the R32 for the first two events. Right. Yeah. That's. I, I guess I never really thought about it like that, but 
And Man, we were really lucky that it was Orlando as the second one because that's you know home for us. That's oh, a right. really about hour drive from us. So. This is one of those sports that I think you'll even probably agree that you're not. This isn't one of those things like golf where you qualify and you make so much money in, in that one event that yeah. it's like, oh, well, I made a great paycheck. This is one of these ones where it almost you're almost in the hole all the time, mm-hmm. even when you're in the top. You know, you're looking for that funding, so you do it for the love of it, and then. That's it. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. It's definitely a passion driven. You know, we're all the drivers, we're all out there because we love to do it. And, you know, we, we want to go out there and we want to win and we want to earn the championship. But it's also, it's like when you get to the events and you get to go through, you know, meeting all the people in the pits and doing the autographs, you know, all the events, you get people from not only just different states, but people flying from different countries to certain events to right. come see. And so it's it's actually a super cool experience. I think mean, FD is one of the only uh, like motorsport series that has like an open pit. So it's kind of cool to have that more one on one experience with you know the fans, the customers, and everything like that. They get to come out and see the cars firsthand because you know especially people coming internationally, like for most time they can only see the cars you know via the live stream. Yeah. It's like all right, cool. You know, it looks like they're going fast. But I had a bunch of friends come over to Irwindale a couple years ago. And they saw the cars running at Irwindale in person, and they were like, it's nowhere near the same on live stream. We can't believe oh, no. it is in person. And yeah. so it's, it's cool to see people you know, really react to, to that stuff. Yeah, cameras are tough. They don't really capture the the speed part. You know what I mean? They can capture smoke, they can capture action, they can capture movement, but they don't really capture the speed. So you lose a lot of that. Uh, and, and, and just like the gravity of noise. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's one of the most yeah. pressing things I think I know. Like when, when when you're standing there in person, you know, listen, these cars are way more impressive in person than you see. You know, you almost get these uh, desensitized to them when you see yeah. so many pictures of these radical engines kind of stuffed into S chassis and you know Supras and different cars. But oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's, it's a different perspective when it's just, you know thirty forty feet in front of you and you're seeing it run off you know, a wall inches doing 80, 90 mile an hour, you know, and it's, it's completely different perspective, you know, than, than the live stream because the live streams can zoom in and all that, but yeah. it just completely kills, you know, the actual seeing it, you know, one-on-one. So going into this season for people that don't know, you're going to be running the same, uh, you campaign in the same car that you did last year. Yep. Yeah. We're running the same car again. Um, that's 14. We're going to be running the RV power plant again. And, this is, I think, going to be our final season with this chassis, which okay. will be I think, the fourth year I've had it now. Um, and then we picked up just recently uh, a new three, like a 370Z chassis that we're going right. to start digging into in the next uh, probably couple months here. We're going to wait and get the season started, make sure everything's good with my car, and then we'll start tearing into that one and start playing around with it to get it set up. And our goal is to campaign the 370 for uh, next season 2020. That's pretty wild, man. Do you think it's going to be – a big transition. I mean, not from necessarily, you know, I'm sure you'll pick up the whole drifting and comfortable part of running that platform, but you know, you've been in, in an S chassis for so many years now. Um, and, and especially your car. So your car to me, I love your car. It's, it's that purest ultimate kind of right hand drive. It's got a 180 SX front. Yep. Yeah. It's got 180 front on the S14. Right. And I think it's one of, I think me and Forsberg uh, are the only Nissan powered Nissans going into next year. So, right. But, Everyone else is their V8 or Jay-Z or something like that. But right-hand drive. And so you – like even the R32 is right-hand yeah. drive. So yeah, yeah. do you think there's any going to be any um, major adjusting, adjustment curve kind of happen, happen into the left-hand seat on the 370? Um, well, we're actually like contemplating converting it right-hand drive to it. <laughs> okay. Um, that would take that away. <laughs> yeah. So I've just – I've been you know drifting right-hand drive now for like five years or so. And right. I've just – gotten comfortable with it right um uh, i can still jump in like a left-hand drive car and go out i just have kind of lost that 100 percent. like that's my dominant yeah. kind of hands driving style yeah right for that. so um you know with the 370 like i'm probably gonna play around with it a little bit this year still left-hand drive and kind of get the you know feel for the car and all that but i think once you actually go to do the full tear down and build of it we're probably gonna end up uh you know shipping over some racks and stuff from japan and, okay and just converting it so that way it's it's more of like my comfort zone for that so here's my question <clears throat> you have spent more time and, and one of the things i love about the car the fact that it's rb power planted right 
But one of the things you have spent so much time throughout your program doing, the one constant besides maybe an S chassis has been this RB. Yep. Do you think the RB will follow yourself, follow itself into the 370? Has there been talks about that? We're, we're weighing it out. Um, definitely am trying to bring that program over to the 370. Okay. Uh, it's not 100% yet. Obviously, uh, just this past year was our first year uh, with doing the big displacement RV right. engines. Yeah. The 30 blocks, and they're stroked out to a 3.2 liter. The car ran great. You know, we had initial issue at the beginning of the season with the engine locking up that ended up being a uh, human error in the building section of it. And then at the end of the season, I ended up lifting the head after a season of abuse really on the engine. Right. Um, come to find out we had some like some excessive back pressure issues that we're still trying to figure out exactly if we're just over the peak of our turbo and we're just with the nitrous on top is just creating too much flow from it. Uh, so we're, we're doing a, a bunch of tests. I've been in the dyno two, three times now with the car, uh, just getting back pressure, EGT numbers and all that. We're trying to figure out on potentially next, uh, next year, next season, jumping to a, a bigger turbo. So once we get all that sorted out and we're running through this season, we're going to see how the engine goes, but the plan is to hopefully bring the RB over into the right. 370 chassis. Um, but we'll see, uh, you know, what happens with, throughout the year. If it's, if it's, you know, if we've proven that we, maybe just hit the limit of power and reliability with it. Um, you know, maybe we'll be looking into other options, but the goal is to, to try and keep it Nissan powered Nissan. So. so for those who don't know, you run it, it's an RB, it, I guess it'd be dubbed an RB32. Am I right? Yeah, technically, yeah, is what people would call it. Yeah. Right. So for people that don't have any clue kind of how the progression may start, that starts what, with an RB25 block? Uh, this one's RB30 block. Okay. Australia. So it's a three liter block from Australia that uh, one of the Pro 2 drivers, Josh Robinson, yeah, uh, a couple years ago hooked me up. Uh, and when he went back home, he threw four of them on a pallet and shipped them over for me. Okay. Because I've been running 25s for three years and looking to get more time and more power out of the car. So he, right. you know, Australia is the only country that had them effectively, really. Uh, so. When he went back home, he was like, well, I can do some searching for you and send some over if you want. And it was, you know, I can't thank him enough for that because it was, it was a big step in the right direction. Yeah, he's a good guy. So much, so much more torque, more speed from it, too. And it's a bigger block. It's a bit heavier, but it was totally worth it at the end of the day. Their RB30 was in what platform over there? Uh, over there in Australia, they had them in, like, the Holden, like, Commodores. They okay. came in, like, the these nice Commodores, as well as like the old R, I think it's DR30 Skylines over there. Okay. Uh, they had them as well, and they were the only country, I think, the old R30 Skylines to get the RB30. And to go from an RB30 to an RB32, essentially, you're just boring it out and going more of like a stroked setup. It was actually just, uh, it was mainly just a stroke kit from Brian Crower. Um, was able to keep a stock full piston if I wanted, but we ended up doing about a half mil over just to get a fresh cut on the wall so it get a good seal. Right. And so we're making it sound really easy, but for you to campaign that, that RB32 effectively, give people an idea what kind of time, effort, money, and because and, you guys did a lot of stuff, especially with that dry slum sim system, to yep. be able to make yeah, sure we, that this could be a viable platform. Yep. Yeah. Because, I mean, with the, the years we've been running the RB25s, uh, you know, we, we've gone through all the issues and figured out all of its uh, its ups and downs as yeah. far as its oiling problems and all that. So, you know, we had plans to go to a dry sump anyway, whether we're going to RB30 block or, or if we're going to run a 25 again. It's literally just kind of answered all of the issues, the, you know, the primary issues that the RVs have always had, which is oiling. We like to over-oil the head and kind of push oil out of the breathers, out of the valve cover and spray everywhere. Um, you know, as well as not providing, once they do that, they run dry out of the bottom and then it's, you know, you're spinning bearings, you're having cams season in the head. To, to step up to the 30 from the 25 wasn't too much. There's some modifications you can do the block, uh, in order to fit a tensioner and to run, uh, the proper head gas that you want with it. But other than that, it was a pretty straightforward setup. Um, they run the same bell housing as RB25, so my G-Force from the RB25 was able to swap over my same clutches and everything like that. So if somebody was <clears throat> had the money to spend, what what exactly do they need to kind of get an RB30, maybe not to the degree that you guys are doing, what do they need to get an RB30 kind of powering 
an S chassis they're running? Just basic. Um, I mean, basic thing is the 30s over in Australia. If, if you're to get one here stateside, most people sell them just as short blocks because in Australia they only came with a single cam head, which a lot of people just ditch and go for the RB25 dual cam head, right? Um, or a 26 one, whichever you know is in their budget. Um, it's really not too difficult to get them, depending on what power you're looking for. Um, I've been doing a lot of research, and guys in Australia are doing, you know, in the four and five hundreds or so on with really just doing the head swap to an RB30 and putting the proper size turbo and, and injector on it, and just kind of running that for a while. Um, you know, when you go to do any of the RB stuff, I would recommend people that they just do at least a new oil pump on it. You know, all the new timing components, just the basic kind of swap stuff. If, you know, anyone that's can either buy a Jay-Z or any kind of, you know, whether it's a 5.3 from like a junkyard or something like that, whatever setup they do, everyone usually does at least, you know, the basics. They put an oil pump on it, the new timing set, whether it's a chain or belt and all that. So it's kind right. of the same uh, stuff there. Um, you know, you with the RB then, you, you'll you probably still, if you're just running a factory oil pump, you'll probably have some kind of blow-by issues with it. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but there's, you know, there's tricks while the block's apart that you can drill out certain passages, restrict certain pieces of it, run external drains from the head back to the, the to the oil pan. So, you know, there's a lot of different things that you could do to, to help prevent all that um, and still have a, a good, reliable power plant. 